Hello everyone, my name is Yaxun Kwan, and I'm the main developer of Maestro Cost Model. I created this video to introduce some uh, details about the, the mapping description in Maestro and provide some high-level overview of the Maestro Cost Model. This is the outline of this video, so I'll first discuss the mapping representation in Maestro, which is a data-centric representation of mappings. And and I'll also discuss the high-level overview of the Maestro cost model. Let's get started with the mapping representation. So to, to discuss the mapping representation, I'll use the conv1d operation as a simple target application. So what conv1d does is it's very similar to... Uh, it's just nothing but a sliding window operation. So we overlap the weight vector on the input and compute the element-wise multiplication and we accumulate all the multiplication result to produce the final output. And then we move on to the next position. So we slide by one and we compute the next output performing the same operation. And we can represent this operation in this loopness, so which is relatively simple. Um, it has uh, two loop iterators that correspond to the weight index and output index x prime, and the partial sum represents the element-wise multiplication for each output. So x prime represents the output output in, output index, and s represents the weight index. So the partial sum is uh, the element-wise multiplication, and we accumulate accumulate all the partial sums to generate the final output. And we can construct a computation space based on this loopness. So the y-axis and x-axis, uh, we have loop iterators. And because the partial sum has exactly the same uh, coordinate as the loop iterators, so each point in this computation space is partial sum. And based on uh, this loopness, we can also construct the data space. So yeah, if we take a look at the loopness, we can immediately notice the partial sum, the x prime comma s, access need to access weight s, input x prime plus s, and output x prime. And based on uh, this relationship, we can mark corresponding data points for, for each computation. And please note that data reuse is a behavior in data space, and this is the prime target model uh, for the cost of the DNA accelerators because uh, data reuse is critical for the energy, and energy is the prime optimizing target in DNA accelerators. So we've taken we've seen the computation space and data space, and they can be actually uh, converted easily. Uh, using this relationship. So for example, this partial sum need to access this data. So what I did is nothing but just mechanically apply this relationship to find the corresponding points in data space for each this, for this partial sum. And if we move the partial sum, then the corresponding data point also moves in the data space in this way. So we can we can see the partial sum has one on one correspondence to each data tensor. So let's take a look at an example mapping. So in this example mapping, we will uh, use the same target application, the com one d and we will have three PEs. And in this computation space, uh, we I'm showing the data mapping, uh, sorry, it's the computation mapping to each PE using colors. So P0 takes partial sum 0, 0, P1 takes partial sum 0, 1, P2 takes partial sum 0, 2. And in this example mapping, uh, in the next time step, so yeah, this is the corresponding data space from the initial mapping. So what I did is just uh, applying this relationship to find out the corresponding points in data space. And in the next time step, in this example mapping, we'll move on to uh, this direction, the horizontal direction, which is output. Then the corresponding data points are also updated in data space, as you can see, 
And if you move on to the time step two, then it is also updated correspondingly. And we can, we can actually observe the weight mapping didn't change over time, but output and input activation mapping changed in the, over time steps. That means if we have our local buffers at PE, then we can store those weight values and reuse the weight values for the next time steps. So that's why this kind of mapping is called weight stationary style mapping. And let's take a look at another example. So we will begin with the same initial mapping. So P0 takes partial sum 0, 0, P1 takes partial sum 0, 1, P2 takes partial sum 0, 2. And in this example, we will move on to the vertical dimension, vertical direction, as you can see here. Then the corresponding data space is updated in this way. And in this case, we can notice output didn't change over time. That means we can reuse the partial outputs within the local buffer at each PE then, and we can accumulate new partial, partial output generated from the next time step uh, and accumulate that to the existing partial output results in the local buffer to produce the final output. So that's why this mapping style is called output station mapping. So one thing I wanted to emphasize from here is that data reuse opportunities are explicit in data space. And we want to model the data reuse. So let me briefly compare the computation and data space. So computation space describes the computations, which means what it does. However, data space describes the data mapping, and it, which means what it uses and computation space usually has higher dimensionality than data space. And compared to, so for example, for Comp2D operations, so computation space is seven dimensional, but data space is in four dimensional. And computation space is easier for programmers to understand because it is a traditional way to view the, the operations and we have a, a solid representation, which is loop nest. However, for data space, it's easier for tools to analyze the data view because it's explicit. However, we don't have the representation yet. So that's why we developed our, our the Maestro's data centric description of the mapping. So data-centric data repre representation of the mapping is based on the uh, three data-centric directives. So let me introduce uh, those directives. The first directive is temporal map. So the syntax is something like this. So temporal map, and we have two integer parameters, mapping size and temporal offset. And we write the dimension ID uh, the, the data dimension we are describing the mapping on. To understand what is the temp, what temporal map is, so let's take a look at this example. So this is a this is an example data mapping on output tensor or in, in for com one D case is alpha vector. So I'm also using the colors to represent the uh, mapping to each PE. So in this case we also have three PEs in this example. And this is the initial mapping and the next time step, we will move on to the next mapping in this way, in the next time step in the same, in the same way. And what we observe is the mapping changes over time. That means we need to use temporal map to describe this data mapping. And the next thing we need to uh, take a look at is how many data points we map to each PE and we, we can observe we mapped only one data point to each PE, so the mapping size parameter is one. And the index in the next time step is actually nothing but a previous index uh, plus one. That means the temporal offset is one, so we write one to the temporal offset. And we are writing 
the mapping on the dimension x prime, which is output vector. So we write x prime here. Then we describe this data mapping. The high level semantics of temporal map is mapping the same data across all the PEs and update the mapping over time. And the second, the next directive is spatial map. The, uh, the syntax is pretty similar. So spatial map and two integer parameters, mapping size and spatial offset, and the dimension ID. So let's take a look at an example uh, to understand spatial map. In this example mapping, P0, P1, and P2 uh, takes different uh, weight values. So this is a weight vector. P0 takes the weight 0, P1 takes weight 1, and P2 takes the weight, weight 2. And we can observe the mapping to each PE changes across space, which is PE. That means we need to use spatial map. And the same way, we mapped only one data point each PE, so the mapping size is one. And what is the difference in indices for each for each PE? This is nothing but the uh, previous index plus one for the next PE. So the spatial offset is one. And we are writing, uh, we are describing a mapping on dimension S, which is weight vector. And the high-level semantics of spatial map is mapping different data across PEs with certain offset, and it impl implies parallelization. And sometimes spatial map can also have some temporal aspect like this. From 0, 1, 2, we need to move on to 3, 4, 5 to cover entire dimension. And this happens when we don't have enough number of PEs uh, to cover the entire data dimension. And in this case, the implicit temporal offset is applied. Uh, in this case, it's the number of PEs. So let's let's gather uh, those. Let's, let's take the the directives in mind and let's take a look at this full mapping example. So we need to describe mapping not only for one vector uh, but across all the vectors. Then how do we do that? So first, uh, the input indices can be inferred from weight and output. So let's just focus on the weight and output. And we want to describe the full mapping, the full example mapping shown in the left side. So in time step zero, this is the initial mapping. And we will move on to this mapping over time. Then how do we describe this? First, we describe, we use directive to describe each data, uh, each data index or the, each data dimension, I mean. So I just did the same way we did in the previous examples. And actually, they, you know, those are the exactly the same uh, examples. Then the question is, how do we represent the, the order of change? So we observe the weight is stationary and output changes over time. That means output changes faster uh, and weight will change slower. So how do we represent that information? We use the order of the directives. Uh, the the uppermost directive changes slowest in a slowest manner, and the lowermost direct directive indicates the mapping on that corresponding dimension will changes in the fastest manner. And this is this is the, very similar to the loop nest. In the loop nest, uppermost loop uh, in, changes in the slowest manner, and innermost loop changes in the fastest manner. Is, is in the same context. So directive order represents the relative order of the change or update in each data dimension. So we take a look at, we described the full mapping on the one example. So we have the same example on the left side. Over the time, uh, it updates the output first. So it is, this is the same example as the one we have in the previous slide. And this is weighted stationary style mapping because weight changes slower than output. But what happens if we change the directive order? Then what's the uh, result in mapping? I, I just switched the directive order of these two directives. 
Then the initial mapping is the same. We didn't change the mapping size or offset. So initial mapping is the same, but over time, weight will change for first and output will remain stationary because the directive order represent the relative order of the update or change of the data mapping. So suddenly we got output stationary. And if you take a look at so the reuse factor and minimum buffer size to support uh, this mapping, uh, the reuse factor means the number of accesses per uh, fetch from the upper memory hierarchy. That means how many times do we, re we, we reuse each data point. The reuse factor is updated in this way. So, and it means we converted the weight reuse to upper reuse by changing the directive order. What happens if we, sweep, if we flip the spatial and temp temporal directives? We, I'm, I'm going to change the spatial and temporal from the base uh, representation. Then what happens? The, initial, the resulting mapping, for the, for the resulting mapping, the initial mapping is something like this. We see the differences. And this, the output will move faster because the directive order is a change, so it is still way stationary mapping. And if you take a look at the reuse factor, the reuse factor is updated in this way. The, the amount of reuse has changed. So this is a different way stationary mapping, but we have a different degree of map. Uh, we, we have different reuse, reuse factor. What about the mapping size parameter? I'll update the mapping size parameter of the temporal map on x prime dimension. Then the resulting mapping is something like this. And over the time, it will be updated, updated in this way. This is still a weight stationary mapping, but uh, we got different reuse factor and minimum buffer size it has increased to three because we are mapping three output values, output data points to each PE. So this is yet another weight stationary, but has different view specter and minimum buffer size. So so far, we observed uh, various we observed uh, uh, variations of uh, mapping from the base example mapping. We switch we switch the directive order, we change the mapping size, and we flip the temporal and spatial. But we observed a complex trade off space based on the, those subtle changes. And directives can precisely describe those uh, data flows and mappings. So far, we've seen a sim relatively simple example, but let's take a look at a slightly more complex example. So this is still on the COMP1D uh, operation, so we have the same computation space. However, we are we now have six PEs and we want to map computation in this way. And the mapping will move on to this direction over time. But the, the question is how do we describe this data flow? Can you do that using uh, the temporal and spatial map? Actually, uh, that is not possible. So that's why we introduced the cluster directive. So what we need to do to describe this mapping is first uh, group up set of PEs into clusters and treat them just uh, individual entity. So you can view this as a, now we have two large PEs. And we oops, now we, we take a look at the mapping over these clusters. The, cl the mapping over these clusters move in, moves in this way. So we use the same thing for each cluster, so treating each cluster as one PE. So temporal map of uh, nine on S dimension, which is weight. So as you can see, we have, uh, we mapped nine data points in S dimension. And we are parallelizing or mapping different values uh, or spatially mapping the X prime dimensions Across each, across each cluster. And we are mapping three data points for each cluster. So the, the mapping size three, and this is on X prime dimension. So we, we can think in this way. So the mapping target of these directives are 
these entire clusters. So we are treating them as uh, the one large PE. And then we also need to describe the mapping inside each cluster. Inside the cluster, we do the same thing. Uh, we describe the data mapping using those directives. So P0, 1, 2, 3, they take three weight value, values, three weight values, three weight values, so mapping size is three, and offset is three. We can easily uh, represent this one. And for the X prime dimension, the output dimension, we are mapping uh, three, I, three output data points, and all the P's got the same data, same output in the index. So the mapping size is three, and we use the temporal map. And for these descriptions, the mapping targets are PEs inside one cluster. And what you need to do is just combining this information to describe, to provide full information regarding this mapping. So over the cluster directive, we describe the mapping over the clusters and Below the cluster directive, we describe the mapping over PEs inside each cluster. And the cluster directive has size of 3, that means it will contain 3 PEs. So using those 3 directives, we can actually describe more complex data flow and mapping. So we will deep dive into one example, which is an iris-like data flow. So this is a full comp 2 d mapping uh, of the iris-like accelerator. So this is a full description and uh, right side we have the visualization of this. So uh, let's take a step by step into this example mapping. So this is a uh, full mapping description of uh, this example. So there are several parameters like here. So these are three variables. So iris paper also uh, changes, changes this uh, mapping sizes for each layer. And we have a one cluster directive. That means we will have a 2DP array. So um, cluster directive, you can also view that as we are adding one dimension by having a cluster directive. Uh, and there is size of R, which means the uh, filter row. Uh, PEs which in each cluster. So I just put some uh, numbers into the three variables and we will assume three by three filter and six PEs in total. So we have six PEs and because we have cluster directive of size three, so each cluster will have uh, three PEs. For... And because we have six PEs and each cluster need to contain three PEs, if we divide the 6 by the uh, 3, then we get two clusters. And we also need, then we will anal analyze the tile size and offset. So if, take, if we take a look at the mapping size on K dimension, which is output channel, we can observe we mapped two output channels. Oh, before that, so. The left side diagram is the mapping over cluster 0 and the right side is mapping over cluster 1 at the same time step, time step 0. So the mapping size of, on the K dimension is 2, so we are mapping two output channels like this. And for input channel, the C dimension, we have the mapping size of 2 as well. So we are mapping two input channels. For the y dimension, which is the input row, uh, we are mapping three input row. So that's why we have uh, three input rows here. And we have offset of one to, uh, to, in, to implement the sliding window. So the offset is not three, but one to implement the sliding window. And the mapping side on x dimension, which is input column, is 3 as well. So that means we are mapping 3 input columns. And following, uh, and based on this mapping, so we can write the actual data indices to each PE at time step 0, so cluster 0 and cluster 1. So I did nothing but converting this diagram 
in the right side into the list of in, uh, indices, data indices for each tensor. So there will be some replication. Uh, for example, up channel exists in weight tensor side and up up tensor side as well because they the upper channel is coupled with both of the output activation and filter weight. So this represent the mapped data indices uh, for each cluster at time step zero. Then I will not go into all the details about uh, those numbers, but I will highlight the reuses using colors. So what's the reuse? Reuse means uh, the, the same set of data indices mapped uh, over uh, different keys and time steps. So I use colors to actually highlight the same set of data indices. So as we can see for the weight filter tensor, uh, P0 and P3 in cluster 0 and cluster 1 gets the exactly same mapping. And P1 and P4 also gets the same map data mapping. P2 and P5 also get the same data mapping. And if we mark that into the PRA, then we will get uh, this relationship. And, uh, the, the diagram is from the iris paper and we you can observe the data we use is exactly uh, the same as described in the iris paper for filter for the same way uh, I did the same thing for the input tensor so I used the color to uh, highlight the same data mapping and also highlight it in the PRA diagram and we can observe uh, the same data reuse pattern as described in uh, the, the, the original paper. The same for the output tensor as well. So, so far, uh, this, is a, a more, this is a more complicated example, but still we could describe the full mapping using the directives and we could observe the same behavior as the uh, original, original, original accelerator.